doctor, major general, father, hero of the American Revolution, martyr who spilled his lifeblood fighting the British hand-to-hand at Bunker Hill. And yet most of us have never heard his name. We'll meet the citizen soldier who helped change the world next. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. In this episode, I'm really excited to hop in our time machine with a passionate author who's going to take us back to, in Thomas Paine's words, the times that try men's souls. Once there, we'll get on the trail of a forgotten patriot, described as the founding grandfather of the United States of America for his early defiance of unjust British rule. Our guide on this journey is Christian Despina, who brings us Founding Martyr, the life and death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's lost hero. As a physician, Warren put his life in danger to treat his neighbors in the smallpox epidemic of 1764. He then dared to speak out against King George's rule a decade before the vocal patriots whose names we all know today. On September 6th of 1774, he introduced the first draft of the Suffolk Resolves in defiance of the Massachusetts colonial government and demanding the repeal of the Intolerable Acts, laws passed as punishment for the Boston Tea Party. He was demanding a voice long before those chants protesting taxation without representation. When British muskets cut down protesters, Warren served on a committee that assembled a report on what became known as the Boston Massacre, ultimately leading to a boycott of British goods, and his polemical arguments helped turn citizens-born loyal British subjects into free-thinking American patriots. When war broke out, Dr. Warren became General Warren. His neighbors considered his life too valuable to risk in battle, and yet risk it he did at Lexington and Concord. Finally, he sacrificed himself at Bunker Hill, manning a redoubt against waves of redcoats, and staying at his post even after running out of ammunition so his men could escape. Christian Despina is based in the Big Apple and Williamsburg, Virginia. A regular speaker and volunteer at Colonial Williamsburg, he's an expert on the history of this era and educates a wide variety of audiences with the passion and mastery of facts that you'll find in his book. Visit him at foundingmartyr.com or at martyr1776 on Twitter. Okay, I'm pretty excited to talk to today's guest, so let's load our muskets, prepare to cast our lot in the fight for independence, and meet Dr. Joseph Warren, Founding Martyr. I'm joined on the line by Christian Despina, author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show, Christian. I really appreciate it, Dean. Thanks. Well, we've been talking here for, I don't even know how long. It's probably, it's probably like 20 minutes before we even got to recording <laughs> because you're a passionate author and I so appreciate you having written this book and having returned Dr. Joseph Warren to the American people. Here is somebody that we haven't seen a million times. He hasn't been in the Hall of Presidents as an animatronic telling us his story, but his contribution to the cause of independence was just as big, if not bigger, than many of the names that we know because his life was cut tragically short. Now, for me, my journey in getting to know Dr. Joseph Warren was from getting your book, obviously. Feather S. Foster, presidential historian, historian of First Ladies, recommended you to me. So for me, it was easy. I just had to click and open an email. You had a much more interesting journey to finding him, and I love it. It's one of those stories that starts with a treasure tucked away in a bookstore, and it sets you off on a decades-long quest 
for truth that readers like me get to enjoy just by opening a book that's already printed. I don't have to go track down the relatives and the first primary sources and all those things. So let's travel back to revolutionary times and tell me a little bit about how you first met Joseph Warren. Well, I mean, you had always heard about him marginally, right? I mean, he's always been mentioned in, you know, any kind of time you read a book about revolutionary boss and the book is usually if at all will pepper his name it's a sentence here a sentence there buried in a footnote and when you start to get to know a little bit about him like when i read that book from that bookstore and that was totally serendipitous you start realizing all these things wait a minute so he sends paul revere on his midnight ride he gets killed at the battle of bunker hill he delivers these fiery boston masquerations but why is he always relegated to a footnote. And that's when it began the journey. But, the, you know, it's, it's almost a double-edged sword because you realize, okay, now I understand why nobody's writing a million biographies about him because the primary source evidence is so scant. The, his papers have been lost. A lot of them were destroyed in a fire, two fires actually in the mid-19th century. So really there's not much on this guy. And you start to realize this is why people are not going to really take the chance and hope that they can find things when they start doing the research. I find those things so fascinating because it's a discouragement that's built in where they'll tell you, oh, there's nothing to find. I know for even my family story, which is something I'd very much want to know, everybody said, well, the Turks burned everything and killed the, the family that was extended family for the most part when your grandparents were thrown out of Asia Minor. And then when they was the invasion of Cyprus, that's where my other half of my family came. So there's nothing out there to learn. And I didn't realize that that was so ingrained in me until my wife started digging into the genealogy and she found things. In fact, she found living relatives that we didn't know that we had. So when you aren't stopped by that initial moment of, well, there was a fire, everything was burned, you sometimes find things that make me, as somebody who reads history, shocked. I say, how could this guy, Christian, have found new primary sources that were never touched before? How could he have found relatives that nobody found before? It's almost a state of denial that, that you would be able to find that. And then your answer is, well, I looked. I just didn't take the first no for an answer. I said, well, let me, let me check you on that, because you might be wrong and not even know you're wrong telling me that there's no primary sources, right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, and, and believe me, Dean, a lot of it is luck. You know, it's it's easy to sit here and say, oh, well, you know, the, you know, I did so much research. I mean, I did do a lot of research, but a lot of it is luck and a lot of it is being in the right place at the right time. And what was fortunate for me was when I went up to Boston, obviously, I don't live up there. So when I would go up there, I would look at some of the material again for a sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth time. And sometimes when you have a little distance of time between you and this primary source, you're almost looking at it from a different mindset, different point of view, and you pick up things you hadn't seen before. And I can't even tell you how many things that I came across that were in plain sight that no one else just seemed to pick up on. I mean, it was really amazing. Take us back to the period when Dr. Joseph Warren is out there fomenting revolution and say you were trying to recruit me to enlist in the Patriot cause. And this is something I would think that at Williamsburg, you're expert at putting yourself in that moment, explaining and bringing alive for modern people what that would have been like. We're sitting in a tavern and we're going to meet Dr. Joseph Warren. You're bringing him in to talk to me, or maybe you're just using him as an example of why we need to fight. You're using some of his words that you've read to try and spark that fire of rebellion inside me. How would you describe this man that I was about to meet and that readers will meet in your book, Founding Martyr? Yeah, let's start with the taverns. They really are the nerve centers of the rebellion. So it's the movie theaters, Broadway, hotels, speaking venues, ballrooms. You can get a newspaper there. I mean, it's everything in one. Really, the taverns are the entertainment centers of any town or city. And, you know, it's so relevant to today. That's why when I hear people say, well, history is boring and I no, history is alive. It's repeating itself. You know, we earlier we were just talking about the 1764 smallpox outbreak. So in a town like Williamsburg, Virginia, where there's 15,000 residents today, it's the same as it would have been in Boston in the 1760s. And imagine there's a young doctor who was on the forefront of these smallpox inoculations saving lives. 
So immediately when this smallpox epidemic subsides, Warren becomes a figure of authority. He's getting a lot of respect from the townspeople in Boston. So he's already been known as a skilled healer. So he already has a reputation. People know him. He's a professional. He's a gentleman. He's educated at Harvard. So he's a scholar. People are letting them into their homes. He's there for their most personal moments, the, the birth of a child, the death of a family member. So they're really placing themselves in his hands, you know, medically. And now it starts to turn and people are listening to what he's saying politically. He's young. He's charismatic, bold, daring, brave, forthright, honest. So people are listening to what he has to say. And and that's so important because so many times people say, well, how does a guy who comes from a farming family rise to become one of the top political, social, military, economic leaders in the colony of Massachusetts? And, you know, it's it, you almost in a way say it's inexplicable, but then you can trace that rise back to that 1764 smallpox epidemic. So if we walk into a tavern, you're going to know who Warren is and you're going to want to listen to what he has to say because he becomes this trusted figure. And then he starts to become this incendiary revolutionary who starts using his medical practice for the benefit of the patriot cause. You write in Founding Martyr, quote, Warren helped transform many New England taverns into nerve centers for rebellion and revolutionary activity. Whenever I think of a tavern in this period, I think of the old 76 house in Tapan, New York, and I interviewed the tavern keeper there, Robert Norton, and we talked about many of those themes because here's the place where they come and they tell George Washington that Benedict Arnold has betrayed the cause. He tried to surrender West Point, which I can't imagine having to deliver that news. You know, you hope that Washington won't <laughs> shoot the messenger, right? And uh, Seriously. <laughs> you go to a little place like that, which is restored, and he didn't do any of those things where you wear little outfits, and he didn't want it to be campy. He wanted it just to be the right. same place and rip out the green shag carpet that was there on the floors and the drop ceiling over many years. There have been many changes show where they kept Benedict Arnold's conspirator locked up there, Major John Andre, and they put him to the noose a short way above on a hilltop. Mm -hmm. All the major revolutionary generals and people in the Continental Army went there. Washington took his meals there. It's where the British came and they recognized the U.S. as a free and independent nation. I think the ship was the Vulture, which gave a 21-gun salute to the new nation. That was a place where everything happened, even the mail. That was one thing I think you left out of your list of things. If you needed to get your mail, you'd say, well, send it to the 76 house. It was then called Maybes back in George Washington's day, and I'll pick it up there. Exactly. If you needed to find out what was going on, you'd go there. If you needed to hire somebody, you would go there or transact business, right? You would go there. For Dr. Warren, people were ambivalent, some of them, about independence. And it would have been easy, I'm sure, to say, well, I'm a doctor. I'm not going to take sides in this. But he chooses to. What is it about him, do you think, as a person that makes him have that broad perspective and decide he's going to throw in against the injustice of crown rule? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things is, right, you and I are both from uh, New York, New Jersey area. And if you think about it, this is a highly stratified social hierarchical society in Puritan Boston, you know, but Warren is not born with this silver spoon in his mouth. So he can walk into a tavern and relate to these, you know, working class people, you know, people on the docks, you know, at the port of Boston, he's, he's not an aristocrat. He's not part of this upper echelon. So he's not walking in, he's not snobby. He can relate to so many, you know, he, 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 when you think about it, he can relate to every single rung on that social ladder. So a guy like him, who's walking into a tavern, he can relate to those people. They're going to listen to him. And that I think is one of his, the keys to his charismatic personality, right? Because he is a gentleman. He did go to Harvard. So he, he has you know, the it factor, you know, he can walk into that tavern and he can get a crowd to listen to him, you know, because they know that he is a man of the people. He was not born with the silver spoon in his mouth. So he's just not talking revolution. His actions are backing everything up. And that's such, you know, an appealing factor to someone back then as it would be now. 
It's a way to compel people to listen to him without doing it at the point of a gun. Winston Churchill said words are the only things that endure. And we have some of his words so we can go back and we can read and see what he was talking about, what his pitch was. And whatever he was doing before we get even, even get into Founding Martyr, man, was it effective at ticking off the British rulers of the colonies. In Founding Martyr, you quote a British commander who calls Dr. Warren the greatest incendiary in all America. And I wanted to write that down so I would let it sink in for listeners to get an idea of the kind of man we'll be reading about. This guy is above all of the names that we hear as public enemy number one. If people remember the second Iraq war, handing out those playing cards, right, with the portraits of all the Iraqi generals and various chemical weapons men, the sons of Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein himself. This guy was an ace. He was one of the top guys they were looking to capture when they were trying to crush their rebellion. So how did Warren earn that contempt? What made him a firebrand for independence before it was cool? Right. And that's the thing, right? Because we talk about these founding fathers and I use the phrase founding grandfather because in the 1760s, you know, you don't hear Washington, Jefferson, John Adams. You don't hear these titans who will later become the founding fathers agitating for revolution, these resistance activities against these what they view as oppressive British policies. So you have Warren who's involved in all these incendiary actions, right? So we can go back to the Stamp Act riots, okay? We talk about his medical practice. He's using that for the benefit of the Whigs. The year before, Pope's Day, November 5th, 1764, a child is killed during the rioting. This is when the two gangs would meet and they would hang effigies of the Pope. And it was this big uh, raucous ceremony they would have. You know, Warren uses his standing as a doctor to defend one of the people who's been accused of the rioting. But again, so... He's writing polemical arguments. He's delivering the fiery Boston massacre orations. He's authoring the Suffolk resolves. And and again, if Warren had done nothing else but author those resolves, we would owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. He's involved in every major battle and skirmish between April 19th and June 17th, 1775. He is on the front lines and involved in every major insurrectionary event in the town of Boston between 1765 and 1775. And literally, he's walking around with a target on his back. The British officers, those royal governors in charge, they know who he is. They know what he's doing. And again, it becomes odious to them. And this is why, and I'm sure we'll get into it later on, this is why what happens at Bunker Hill is so tragic, you know, from our side, from our perspective. I counted 14 U.S. counties named after General Warren, and I did this in the course of just seeing where his legacy was, how many to count them up to see what his place is in the nation. And I noticed when I looked that all are in states, all 14 that are east of the Mississippi. And that gave me an indication of when he was in living memory and when he starts to pass out of living memory. And I use the example of presidential birthplaces. If you look, the concentration of power, even as the nation expands, first it's Virginia, we have a few New York presidents over time, then we have Ohio and a bunch of the Ohio presidents, and then slowly it starts to spread west. We have a Mm -hmm. Texan president, we have another Texan president, we have a couple in California, and ultimately one in Hawaii. So it's presidential birthplace manifest destiny in a way. You see the country spread with General Warren, and he gets left. His legacy, as far as the map goes, stops at the Mississippi. What does that tell us about how the man we meet in Founding Martyr found his contribution to liberty eclipsed by contemporaries such as Paul Revere and those who went on to serve in the New Republic? What does it tell us about the fact that they all eclipse General Warren? And that's part of the problem. Think about it. So Warren dies in 1775. So this is a year before the Declaration of Independence is signed. And there's almost this unwritten rule that in order to be a founder, you have to have signed at least the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. So Warren is not part of this later triumphalist phase of American history. And he's cut down at his prime. And think about it. When he dies, he dies not as an American, but he dies as a traitorous subject of King George III. So there's so many factors that add to his obscurity 
as the years go by. But as you mentioned this, anytime you're going to see a Warren Road, street, county, township named Warren, it's going to be after General Warren. I mean, for a time, there was more streets and counties and towns named after Warren than Washington. Huh. So again, this is part of the problem. You know, he, he, he dies a year before the Declaration of Independence. He dies young. He dies as a traitor as a British subject. And this is why these other contemporaries eclipse him, because they're part, again, of this later triumphalist phase of American history, right? The spirit of 76, they're signing these impressive documents. And then with Revere, I mean, it's almost inexplicable with Revere, but we know when the Longfellow, Longfellow poem is published, that adds to Revere's popularity and Really, if you look at all the primary sources before that Longfellow poem, you're not hearing about Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. You're reading about Warren sending Revere out on that ride. It's good PR to have a poem written about you, especially in that era. Right. It's real catchy, but <laughs> it's true. They, you got to be the guy who sends the guy to go, but hey, he has a horse and everything. Right. And it makes it more and more exciting story, more dangerous, more dashing at the time. Right. And when you don't have somebody there to push your legacy, that's part of the reason. And when you die tragically, it's not necessarily going to land you in front page in the history books when so much else happens after. He's almost like the opening band for the Rolling Stones because right. all the action is going to happen later. And even if you're really good, you're going to get lost in the shuffle. I mentioned author Feather S. Foster and that she recommended Founding Martyr to me. I interviewed her about her book, Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas and Other Stories from the First Lady's Closet. She suggested I ask you a question early on, one that's easy to overlook. How old was Joseph Warren when he was killed at Bunker Hill? Well, he was 34 if we're doing the, um, you know, there's the Julian calendar, the Gregorian calendar. So if you're going by the Julian, he would have been 33, the Gregorian 34. And I think I have that right. By most accounts, histories, he was days after his 34th birthday when he was killed. I mean, so you can imagine, you know, just think about it, Dean, right? I mean, you're an expert on presidential history. So think about all the volumes and volumes of paper that are in the George Washington papers, the Thomas Jefferson papers, the John Adams papers, just the letters between John and Abigail Adams alone. And then you look at a guy like Warren who who hardly has a paper trail. And then you start to understand, well, this is another reason why he's such an obscure figure it's easy just to put him in there as a footnote i guess and forget about him absolutely he's not insisting like the adams is when i speak sometimes to people from the revolutionary era authors from that era i don't speak to the actual people from the revolutionary era although that would be awesome that wouldn't be awesome <laughs> <laughs> but when i speak to the the authors i say the adams is they were so down on themselves, pages and pages of John Adams lamenting, I'm not good enough, I'm so vain, I'm so terrible at this, I'm too short, I'm too bald, I'm too angry, all these things that he had. Everyone else talks smack about the Adamses. And then you look at history books and you say, the Adamses are the one that will have the last word on, on hundreds of people from this era. Right. They're the ones who are going to write, oh, I don't know anything about you except what John Adams wrote, because many times they burned their own papers. And I think that's one good reason if you went back to that time to say, stay on the Adams' good side, or at least even if not on their good side, go there. Because I think they write very right. barely. They write about how horrible they are. I just said that about John Adams. But go to them and say, hey, can you write something down? At least have dinner with them, something, because there's going to be nothing left. And I think maybe that's part of the reason that people looked at General Warren and they said, well, we can only go to the easy sources, which are the Adamses. Their, their writings are everywhere, even before the David McCullough book, which is sitting right here on the bookshelf in front of me. But they said, well, we can't find it in the easy places. And the hard places, especially before the Internet age, those books that you were talking about finding, those written materials, you might not even know that they existed. And so you're just going about things and a hundred years passes. Why not write about somebody I can find easily like a John Adams, like a George Washington? Why not focus on them? And then here we have a man who dies in service of a country that doesn't exist yet being forgotten. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing, the first, 
you know, full biography written on Warren comes out in 1865. And, you know, again, it's this like glass half empty approach to the scholarship. And even one of the contemporaries of the day, if you wanted to call it a book review, but the former Massachusetts governor reads the bio on Warren in 1865. And he says, this is more of a biography of Samuel Adams than Joseph Warren. And I mean, the biography was great because it included so many uh, snippets from primary source letters. So, I mean, it really was a wealth of information. But again, when you read it, you're not really getting the personal side of Warren. And so the second full biography that comes out about Warren comes out 100 years later, 1961. And his biographer writes something to the effect in the introduction of, you know, this is the only the second biography in 100 years on Warren. And it's only intended as a new look at his public career because a personal biography of Warren cannot be written. So, I mean, think about that. Think of his own biographer is, is kind of throwing in the towel <laughs> yeah. on his personal life. Yeah. Just declaring to everybody who comes, Oh, there's nothing there. <laughs> Forget it. Don't look. And this is something that African-Americans run into too. They call it the wall in genealogy. That's often the case, but now people may not even be thinking that there are genetic tests, DNA tests. Right. And now we're hearing more about that. And there are papers out there. There are whole factories of people that are writing things down. And hopefully you could find something. And not everybody has royalty. When you hit royalty, my wife always says when doing genealogical research, that's great because they kept track of everything. Right. It's all the way back. And you can go <laughs> generations and generations. But most of us didn't have that. And often it's in a language maybe that you don't speak or it's some obscure place. Right. So the fact that you didn't give up, I just love that. You pressed into it because... You're the perfect guy to write this book. I don't want to use the word destiny for you that you were destined to write this book because when we're talking about Warren's destiny, it's such a big destiny. Right. Joseph Warren makes a singular contribution to the cause of liberty, and we deserve to have a piece of him. We deserve to know him again, and people can do that through Founding Martyr. If that's part of your destiny to write this book, what a great one to have. Yeah, I mean, and and I, I guess a word I would use is I'm, I'm, I'm no genius, I'm not brilliant, but I am relentless. And it be, you know, and like we were talking about before we started this conversation, we were talking about the family and how I became very good friends with the direct descendants of, of General Warren. And it almost became like a personal mission to try and find as much as I could, because anytime I would find something, I would call the family and say, hey, you won't believe what I I found I found X, Y, Z. And they'd be like, oh, my gosh, I remember my grandmother talking about this when I was a kid. It's been lost. Wow. I mean, that was part of the excitement, right? It's, it's one thing to have the excitement to come across something new, right? Because like nine out of 10 times when you're following leads, as I'm sure you know, Dean, they, it's a dead end. But then you get that one little gold nugget. And so you get that rush from it, but then you get to share it with the actual descendants. And that's an incredible feeling. Yeah, I'm sure it is because they could easily have been written off as cast to the wind. I often wonder, we were speaking of the Adamses, I think it's Charles Adams, one of John Adams' sons. He had three, and only John Quincy Adams was really any kind of success and didn't end tragically. And one of the other two had an illegitimate daughter. And I wonder sometimes, because there are probably somebody walking around, or many somebodies walking around out there with presidential DNA that doesn't even know it, uh, uh, yes. because they just paid they paid that woman to go away, and she's just lost to history, speaking of people lost to history. Warren's wife, Elizabeth, she dies after only nine years of marriage, so that gives you an idea of the age of the four kids that are left behind when he dies, just two years after that, Elizabeth, Joseph, Mary, and Richard. I wanted to go and say their names out loud for them to be in this small area of the historical record because here they're orphaned when their father is killed. And to me, that's a bigger sacrifice, certainly a more personal sacrifice than Warren losing his life at Bunker Hill because those children are, what, the oldest one would have been maybe 11, 12 at the time yeah, he died yeah. at max, I guess. So that's a big sacrifice. He knows that if he keeps fighting, he knows he has that target on his back. My children are going to be orphaned and maybe forgotten. And so in a, for me, I see that as a circle of you coming back and giving that man giving Joseph Warren back to his family, back to the link, back to those children who are orphaned and too young at that point to understand why their father's gone, still reeling from their mother dying. You went and found descendants that you told me people forgot about. They said that was another thing that, that you refused, that you were relentless about, that you refused to accept. You said they told you, well, his, his bloodline died out. And you said, okay, let me just fact check that for you for a second. So 
tell us a little bit about Warren's marriage and the home life and the fate of the children and the descendants. Right. And so, you know, this was one of the challenges when the project began, because we had only two things about his wife, Elizabeth, a death notice and a marriage notice. And I was able to find her father's probate will, which opened another keyhole into Warren's life to see what they inherited from her father, because her father was a wealthy merchant, an Anglican, a Mason. Turns out that they inherited uh, half of what was called Hutan's Wharf. So this is going to have consequences because it's connecting Warren to the seaside population, the sailors, the ship captains. So this is going to have major ramifications when the Boston Tea Party occurs. When the children are all open, it becomes a heartbreaking story because at the time Warren is engaged to a Mercy Scully and she has care of the children and she's telling Warren's brother and the mother that General Warren wanted her to care for the children, but you know, they're taken away from her and brought to Warren's mother. And it's this nasty custody battle that ultimately ends and resolves peacefully. And his fiance becomes friends with the family and is in touch with the children. But, you know, their home life, you know, again, there's so many questions. I was able to find out that the, they were actually building a mansion estate in West Boston, and he was having all these custom construction upgrades done. You know, you realize that he has his medical practice in the home. The children are really small. I was able to find out through the family tree from the direct descendants that they actually had a child who died in infancy. And so you see that they would have shared that heartbreak of losing a child and, you know, relatively young. And then you see Warren's wife getting sick. They transfer that Hutan's Wharf property to Warren's brother a week, a week before Elizabeth dies. And, you know, we there's a little poem that he wrote when she died. So it's one of the rare views into Warren's personal life. But again, it was such a challenge because we, we didn't even know where Elizabeth was buried. We didn't know anything about her. Wow. You know, and it turns out even the painting that was done was a, it was ascribed to John Copley. I found out that it wasn't painted by John Copley. It was actually painted by Henry Pelham. So again, there's all these little things. And I mean, it's not a whole lot, but it does add to more than what we knew about them previously. How did you find the descendants? What's the road to that? Because I bet that wasn't simple. Warren is not exactly an uncommon name and you have no way of knowing if it's been carried down. You know, Dean, believe it or not, it actually was incredibly simple. I mean, it's I mean, it's almost laughable. And I'm going to tell you because there's two ways. First, I started doing a Google search and I started, you know, Warren descendants. I came across, I think on the eighth Google page, I came across this thing about a furniture store in Warren, Warren County, Virginia. And it was claimed that they were the direct Warren descendants. But what I did was when I was at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Copley painting of Warren the trustee of the painting was someone called Carolyn Matthews. So I called and it turns out she's the fifth great granddaughter of Dr. Joseph Warren. She's the trustee of the painting. She put me in touch with the family historian and that's how it happened. And I said, I don't understand every single book, every biography, any magazine article piece written about you in the last 150 years claims you guys don't exist. <laughs> and he started laughing and he said, yeah, we're almost as obscure as Warren. <laughs> and it's just incredible because there's about 30 of the relatives. And Carolyn Matthews, you know, she carries on the medical tradition. She's a doctor at Baylor University. And every year she's giving away an annual Dr. Joseph Warren Prize. Wow. When you really get into the nuts and bolts of the family, you realize not only is there a medical dynasty, but there's a military dynasty. West Point graduates, a general, commissioned officers, non-commissioned officers. There's been a Warren direct descendants who served in every single... American conflict from the Civil War to the present day. I mean, it really, you know, again, Dean, I can't underscore what a treasure trove of information just finding those descendants was, you know, all those keyholes that opened into Warren's personal life. It's a gift that keeps on giving. This book, Founding Martyr, and your story that you're telling now, and the way that you tell it, it invites people in to say, I don't have to give up when someone tells me, hey, there, no, there's no there's no people to find or there's no descendants. And so that road is closed. People do that often. Right. If somebody in authority tells you you read it written in a book that there are no descendants, you'll just go and, and move on and you won't fact check that. And for me, I have people correct me all the time or I find things that I thought were right that were wrong that aren't in the primary source. 
I always use as an example Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty by Charles Learson, because here was somebody written off as this horrible, belligerent racist who murdered people, and then he goes and checks and tries to find the tales and finds out he's the exact opposite, that none of those things hold up, that it was all fake reporting. Now, in this case, it's not fake reporting about the Warren descendants, but it's things that Sometimes we get a story and we say, oh, that sounds good. We trust the person telling us. We trust the book we read it in. And then you say, well, wait a minute. Actually, they relied on something that wasn't quite right or they didn't have access to this new treasure trove of of writings that I uncovered in my research that nobody knew existed because it was passed down generations or what have you. So I just think that's such a great motivational item. And I imagine for you, since you're working at Colonial Williamsburg, you use those skills to draw people in when you're holding an audience's attention as I'm sure you're holding the audience's attention right now speaking with me but I wondered how that translates into you writing Founding Martyr. How do you bring that kind of skill of holding a crowd and saying hey let me introduce you to this guy Dr. Joseph Warren because he's exciting and he made this huge contribution. How do you then translate that into writing a book that will hold the interest of readers the same way. You know, I again, I had always, I've always been fascinated ever since I was a kid. I was fascinated by the old time baseball players, and I was fascinated by this whole mystique up in Boston, this revolutionary movement, the mystique around Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. So this started when I was very, very young, and. You know, I dabbled in reading books about Warren. I found that one book, as we discussed. I tried to get my hands on anything I could, that first biography. And then when I was an undergraduate student at Columbia University, I did a senior thesis on Dr. Joseph Warren. And my mentor, Dr. Eric Foner, when I was finished, he said, you should write the definitive biography on Warren. And I said, you know, there's just not a lot of information on him, Professor. But, you know, again, I was relentless. And and here's the thing, right? I'm not an academic, so it's not publish or perish for me. So I was able to do this in my own time. I could take 20 years. I didn't have to publish something within three years. So I had the benefit of time on my side. And that's when it turned into a real passion. I thought I really want to try and tell the story. And that's the thing. You know, Dean, as you know, when you start out on this research journey, you don't know if you're going to gain enough information to make this into a book. Is it just going to be a long article? Will it be, uh, you know, an op-ed piece or anything? And, And honestly, so really for the first 10 years, I wasn't even thinking about publication. I I just wanted to try and gather as much information as possible. But again, when I met those direct descendants, it, it kind of took a personal bend for me. And I almost felt an obligation to tell the most accurate story that I could, right? And we're all human. We all make mistakes. But I really did the best I could to get the information from primary sources and to tell it in a way that wasn't biased, that wasn't subjective. And really the goal was, you know, I would love for Dr. Joseph Warren to read this biography and say, yeah, you came very close to describing accurately my life. Well, I feel as if I've met him through your book and I feel so relieved, which is the last phase of the emotion I'm feeling that It's you that wrote this book, because I feel that in the hands of somebody who's a certain kind of academic who writes a book and then doesn't want to do any promotion, doesn't want to talk about it, it's just writing for other academics, not writing for people to pick up and enjoy at the beach, because that's somehow less of an endeavor than it is to write for other academics or to use in the classroom. And to me, why not take Dr. Warren to the beach with you? It, it, there's nothing wrong with that or nothing wrong with him being a summer read or with this book being one that you just keep on your bedside and pick up every now and then that you're not using to write your own academic paper because that's who he was. I'm sure that he went to the beach. He had a, a life of his own. He had a home life. He was he was doing more in those taverns than just fomenting a rebellion. He was living his life. And so I say this is the kind of author I'd want to treat this guy as a subject because Dr. Joseph Warren belongs to all of us and you've given him back. So I really praise you for that. And I'm relieved for his sake because I look at him and I say, I'd like to get to know this guy as you see him and you, because you track down his cold trail, you're able to reconstruct him in a way that does bring him to life. And it gives us a fresh look at a guy who fills in a missing piece because I feel as if, as historians or people that read and enjoy history, we think 1776, that's when it starts, and we forget about 
the opening band for the Rolling Stones to use that metaphor again, even though they're 100%. even though they're British, I probably shouldn't use the Rolling Stones. <laughs> but uh, all right, I use Bon Jovi. How about that? That's a nice New Jersey band. <laughs> but the open that's the opening act, right? And so yeah. he's. So we forget there are people who taught the people. I have another book here in front of me, Bork Cochran. He's the one who taught Winston Churchill so much about public speaking. He served in Congress for a year. Churchill credited him again and again with being the person who inspired him. He showed him around New York when he first visited. He was a real mentor to him, also a friend to Theodore Roosevelt. You look at these people, they did not fall out of the sky. For instance, with John Adams says, you know, we don't have men equal to the task, right? They were like us. They had people they learned from. So who better to learn from here than you, as far as Dr. Joseph Warren goes? Because I, I can't see it in the hands of somebody who didn't really care about the guy and was trying to do more than just write a book and get it published. Right. And, you know, he almost becomes an extended member of the family because you talk about him around the dinner table. You have conversations every night with his family, those direct descendants. And really, it does become a personal thing. And I got to say, you know, I sincerely hope that someone can come along and find more things and build on the scholarship. Right. Because Warren doesn't just belong to me and my book. As you keep saying, I mean, he belongs to everyone and you just hope that someone else can come along and keep expanding on the scholarship. And one thing I wanted to say, you know, it doesn't end with the book. Like you said, I'm doing everything I can, any speaking engagement I can get, any interview I can do. I do it because you want to educate people about Warren, make them realize what an important figure he was in early American history. We even started a Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society for the purpose of education. So, I mean, really, this this is a personal thing for me. And really, I can't imagine writing about anything you're not passionate about, because it's going to show in the writing, you're going to drag in the research. But so again, this, this was something personal for me. This is something I've always been passionate about. So it never felt like a job or a chore. And when you're sitting in these solitary research centers or libraries or historical societies, for me, I, I couldn't wait to get in there and dig into it. You're enjoying my conversation with Christian Despina, author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. For more on our guest and his fresh look at a forgotten hero of the War for Independence, visit FoundingMartyr.com or follow him at Martyr1776 on Twitter. The Wall Street Journal wrote of the book, quote, In Founding Martyr, Christian Despina has produced a gripping biography of one of the American Revolution's earliest activists. This is no whitewashed version of the founding. Christian, let's touch on that phrase, whitewashing, because for a long time we cast the generation that fought for independence as flawless, not that way that John Adams described them and lamented that we don't have men equal to the task. We cast them as supermen and that they were 10 feet tall. And we know that other than George Washington being 10, eight, that nobody was really over like six foot. I mean, these guys are still giant to us, but we also saw the pendulum swing back at various times against some to the other extreme that we should be ashamed of the continentals. And we shouldn't think there was anything great in them leaving behind their comfortable lives on plantation and going out and risking their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honors to spill their blood for a cause they believed in of independence. So how did you strike that balance to ensure you gave us a fair, accurate portrayal of Dr. Warren in Founding Martyr so that he wouldn't be, for lack of a better word, politicized? You know, and that, and that is another challenge, right? I mean, you even if you're writing about someone that you begin not caring for, I think you develop a begrudging admiration for the person. I heard one of my professors talk about that on a biography he had written about Thomas Jefferson. And so I did not want to whitewash history or sanitize Warren's character, right? And and this is one of the things, you know, look, none of us are perfect. This generation is not woke. 200 years from now, people are going to be appalled by things we've done, we're doing. And it's the same with the founding generation. Let You know, let's acknowledge and hold them accountable, but let's not sermonize and, and wag a finger at them and judge them. Because I think a lot of the problem is, is that sometimes people are looking at this period of history from a 21st century mindset, and you cannot do that. I understand people would find certain things odious. We all do. Slavery, 
Absolutely. But some of these issues we're still struggling with 250 years later, right? Racial inequality, social inequality. So we have to look at these events from an 18th century mindset and agree that, yes, these men were human. They had flaws. They participated in things that we find odious today. But these were also men of great courage, great morality, great bravery. They banded together. They showed incredible acts of selflessness. And that has to be recognized. And again, no one's getting a free pass. But sometimes it, it upsets me when, you know, we throw these stones at glass houses. You know, we, we again, hold them accountable. Yes, talk about it. But judging them from a 21st century mindset, you, you, you really can't do that. We could, we could find it distasteful. We, we need to talk about it. But again, these men did incredible things, and that also has to be acknowledged. So again, you're talking about kind of finding this delicate balance, and it is a balance. Balance is the key word when we start with any historical project, because how much of this is going to be Christian Despina and how much of it is going to be Joseph Warren? He's not writing the book on the one hand, you're the biographer of him, but you also don't want to put your finger on the scale one way or the other. And I think that that's what that Wall Street Journal review got exactly right about founding martyr, that it's a gripping biography. It's not a whitewashed version. And I'm sure that that was a little bit defensive on their part. Maybe they didn't want people to think, don't pick up this book because it's just going to be praising and it's just going to be a, this guy was 10 feet tall and it's a wonder that those bullets didn't bounce off him at Bunker Hill. And that's a credit to you because if you find something wrong in a biography or in somebody's historical record, well, you say it, right. make a mistake or you say something terrible or you shoot off a, a tweet, for instance, with uh, Ulysses S. Grant, he sends off that infamous order banning Jewish merchants behind his lines. And he says, if I had Put it aside overnight, as well, Benjamin Franklin did that, right? He would write a letter, put it aside overnight in a drawer, and then throw it away in the morning. Right. And that's what Grant says. If I had just had a little reflection, put it aside and not sent it right away, I never would have done it. And he regrets that for the rest of his life, and it's a mark against him in biographies. And he does try in his lifetime to make up for that. He appoints more Jewish ministers and people in his government and, and things like this. But I, I think that if we had a camera on us 24-7, who knows what things we, exactly. we captured that we were doing and in the yeah. historical record and if we were swimming in the times that they were. Right. Um, for instance, David O. Stewart, we talked about James Madison. He says he had a chance. His friend came and told him, look, you can do this. You can buy a place, free your slaves, send them up to live here and on their own as I have done. You can do this. And if you don't, you're going to be judged harshly in history. Okay, at least that's part of the record. And it doesn't mean that it excuses it. And I think that that's the thing here with Joseph Warren that I definitely wanted to touch upon because you have this title and you read it and you say, okay, he's a founder and he's a martyr. And even the word martyr, it's fallen out of use for us in the Western world. And I guess in the Christian world, because that's where we used to hear about martyrs. And you still have sainthood and people becoming saints, usually not for being martyrs in the Catholic Church in modern times. But that's a word that is very strong and he qualifies for it. He really is a martyr. He really does lay down his life, leaves those four children behind because he believes in liberty and he's fighting at Bunker Hill. So I didn't want his life to be defined by his death. We've covered a lot of his life. So now's a good time to bring up General Warren's sacrifice. What would we have seen if we're there in the heat of battle? We have the mini balls flying over our head, muskets puffing hot smoke in our face. We're there, we're fighting, the redcoats are coming, the redcoats are coming. What would we have seen in those last moments that earns the distinction for General Warren of being a martyr for American liberty? First, I can't even imagine the nerve it would have taken to stand in that readout while the British are scaling those walls and now you know that you've run out of ammunition. So as these British soldiers have finally penetrated this fortified redoubt on their third charge, it becomes a vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat battle. I mean, people are using the ends of their muskets as clubs, throwing stones. It's a bayonet charge that the British make. So now just imagine the glint from those bayonets and all this dust, like you said, and the smoke from the burning of Charlestown and fighting hand-to-hand. 
Now, Warren is the last person to leave that readout because he is directing the retreat, you know, and this was another thing that kind of I, I never understood. So many times you read the histories of this battle and when they mention Warren, it's almost as if he's a cheerleader. Well, he shows up in his fancy clothing and he's just there for moral support. No, he shows up with a sword, a musket, pis pistols. He's actually fighting. And he's the last to leave that readout because he's making sure his men are getting out of there. And, that, and again, I can't imagine the nerve it must have taken to stay there like that. And he's killed in the last minutes of the battle. He's shot through the face and he's killed immediately. Now, what happens, Dean? Think about it. Who are the heroes at the time in the colonies? You know, I talk about this all the time. There's no Superman, Spider-Man, Thor, you know, popular musicians, you know, sports stars. The heroes are either nobility or military figures. And at the time Warren's killed, the hero in the colonies is a British general, General James Wolfe, who's killed during the French and Indian Wars. So this is sort of, the, the, again, this double-edged sword. When Warren is killed, immediately he is catapulted not only to hero status, but he immediately becomes the first, quote, American martyr, because the hero before this is a British general. Now, an American general becomes the martyr. But this one day overshadows all his resistance activities for the decade before, so that if we do remember him today at, at all, it's either, oh, right, he's the guy who sends Revere on his midnight ride, or, oh, yeah, he's the guy who's killed at Bunker Hill. We don't remember the Suffolk Resolves, the Boston Massacre orations, the non-importation agreements, the constant resistance activities, the polemical arguments. All that has kind of fallen by the wayside. And he's really, if remembered at all, it's just for those two things. And again, like you said earlier, you know, he's eventually overshadowed by his contemporaries. You mentioned his writing, and he writes a series of columns under the name Pascalos. So that's June 1766, a full 10 years before 1776. And I wanted you to describe the state of politics in the then colonies at, in that year. And how did reading those pieces help you flesh out your subject and develop this passion for the guy that listeners can hear right now in your voice and that they'll find in Founding Martyr? I, I think the incredible thing that struck me about those articles was how vicious the attack was because if you look at other contemporary pieces they're not using this the, really the name calling i mean he is calling out the royal governor francis bernard he's calling him worthless treacherous a beggar calling him insane i mean it's it's so outlandish for the time and really this is really an early instance of political spin i mean it's so bad that francis bernard wants the publishers of the Gazette arrested, right? And we know that this has happened before with John Peter Zenger and James Franklin. I mean, it doesn't come to pass, but the, these articles are so incendiary and it's considered so outrageous that someone would actually come out with such harsh language. And again, you're talking 1766, 1767, almost 10 years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And, and again, the language is so outlandish. I mean, the, the, the name calling, you know, the smear campaign that you start realizing, like, this is someone who really is so radical so early on before really anybody else was other than Samuel Adams. You mentioned Samuel Adams, and it made me think of John Adams praising Warren. Here I just mentioned about him and John Quincy Adams and Abigail Adams getting the final word on a lot of these founding figures that we don't find records of anywhere else. A newspaper refers to Warren as godlike. And you say that many felt he was destined for greatness and even to eclipse Washington. When we think about how many places, there's a whole state named after Washington, right? Here in New Jersey, I think we have six Washington townships or townships of Washington. His name is, is used all over the state. And then that's nothing like you think the rest of the country, all the Washington avenues and streets and towns and boroughs and counties. Washington, D.C., the capital of the country is named after Washington. All of those statues of him. And here you read contemporaries saying, we thought that Joseph Warren was going to be greater than Washington because of his skills and his commitment. So how does your view from this distance measure up with those evaluations of his interrupted destiny? You know, and this is the thing, right? I, you have some people who say, you know, I can't believe you said that Washington would have been jealous of Warren or... and." 
my whole point is that again let's look at this in the correct time frame from an 18th century mindset not a 21st century mindset so who is george washington in 1775 he's been almost 20 years removed from any battle he's a retired colonel of the virginia regiment when he is nominated as the general of the continental army and shows up in cambridge a lot of people don't know him he will eventually become washington but again washington is not the washington we know today in 1775 Remember, it's Boston, 1775. It's not this miraculous victory of Yorktown in 1781. So my point being, all the founding fathers at the Continental Congress knew who Warren was based on these Suffolk resolves. So when Washington finds out what has happened at the Battle of Bunker Hill, he's repulsed when he finds out how vicious these men were slain on the battlefield, wounded, run through with bayonets. And these are from British primary sources talking about beating in the heads of the wounded patriots with the butts of their gum and guns and running them through with their bayonets. Now, Washington arrives. Soldiers from the provincial army are saying, a new general arrived today. I don't know the name Washington. And just, just to underscore the point, Dean, in 1774, when John Adams first arrives in Philadelphia for the first Continental Congress, he writes a letter saying, I met a man by the name of George Washington today. I never heard of this man before. So again, when Washington arrives in Cambridge in July of 75, he has to fill Warren's shoes. First of all, Warren has just paid the ultimate price on the battlefield. Someone of Washington's character, his bravery, his morals, his ethics cannot help but admire the fact that Warren paid this ultimate sacrifice on the battlefield, leaving behind four orphan children. Warren is a man of the people in Massachusetts. Washington is an outsider. Northern Southern as Northern and Southern rivalry is nothing new, as you know, Dean. It was alive and well during the Revolutionary period. So Washington has to fill Warren's shoes. Warren becomes the hero, the martyr. Washington has not yet proved himself. He will. And you know, we can all point to that famous quote that Washington writes when he says, I find the New Englanders to be a dirty, nasty rabble. And my point has always been. Just think about the role Warren was playing, that on the ground leadership, out of all the military commanders at that Bunker Hill battle, Israel Putnam, Colonel William Prescott, Artemis Ward, Warren is the only one from the area. So he knew that terrain better than anyone. He had the respect and admiration of the people, of the militia units in that army. They all knew who he was. So just imagine how much easier that transfer of power would have been when Washington shows up. And when you read the letters from the founding fathers in the Continental Congress, John Hancock, Samuel Adams, John Adams, they're all asking Warren, not General Artemis Ward, to receive Washington and to read his charge in front of the troops. Warren, not Ward, which shows you the admiration, the respect and power Warren had at the time. So again, when Washington shows up at this moment in history, he has to fill those shoes of Dr. Joseph Warren. He has skills, Warren, and abilities that Washington has to cultivate. I spoke recently with Peter Stark, who wrote the book Young Washington. And like yourself, he's not coming at it from an academic perspective, and that helps his view of Washington. Come at him, look at him fresh. Or David Head, who wrote A Crisis of Peace, and he is a professor and is an academic. So Both great books, yes. Yeah, and certainly a place for, for both ways to look at it. And Washington says that his eyes have grown weak. He's grown not just gray, but blind in service right. to his country. And he said, you know, he really didn't go out and give speeches. And he didn't think he was great at Washington. You think, well, these people must have been great at everything. All of them must have been great at everything, right? Then you actually read the history and you say, oh, hey, he knew he had weaknesses and shortcomings. He worked like heck to control things like his bad temper. You know, who would think that George Washington was had a bad temper? But the guy did. He had to work to master that. He had to work to master his writing. He was embarrassed and insecure about his lack of formal education. These are things Warren wouldn't have had to worry about. He would have slid into that role nicely and had the respect that Washington, who'd never won anything, who, if anything, kicks off the French and Indian War with his impetuous behavior when he's out with General Braddock and he's serving with the British, 
it seems like Warren would have had a much smoother transition, would have been much more respected and less ignored. And I don't think that it diminishes Washington at all to say that because no, it doesn't. Right? As you said, he arrives there and he says, "Gosh, I, I've got, I've got to live up to this guy." He's inspiring to George Washington, and he could still inspire us today, thanks to founding martyr. How cool is that? Yeah, I mean, and again, I, if I could sum it up in one sentence, it would be, you know, before there was George Washington, there was Dr. Joseph Warren. It almost seems that Washington's trajectory to godlike status was when Warren exits the scene. But, you know, of what I have no doubt of, you know, we could sit here and speculate, you know, would Warren have been a president? The one thing I do know is that he would have been just as important in the post-revolutionary period as he was in the pre-revolutionary period. And you could think about him living easily into the War of 1812. And so I know that that's a war that people don't talk about much unless they describe it as the Second American War of Independence fighting against the British. And you think of him being alive in a way that Washington wasn't as a guiding force. And I think the absence of him, the fact that his destiny is interrupted, makes me, having read Founding Martyr, realize just how valuable a guy he was. Yeah, there's really no doubt about it. And again, you, you don't want to create this mythological mystique around him. How, But it really is. You, you really can't ignore the facts. I mean, he was everywhere doing everything. He was the only founding father, like I said, involved in every major battle and skirmish. He's almost killed at the battles of Lexington and Concord. He's killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Where are the founding fathers in this period? You know, they're all sitting in Philadelphia. You know, at the, at the tavern and in Carpenter's Hall. I mean, he is the one. You know, again, I, I say this in the book. He did it all. Voice, pen, and sword. We have time for one final question, although you could probably tell I, I haven't been watching the clock at all in this interview because I'm just loving talking to you and learning about <laughs> Dr. Joseph Warren. But uh, I'll say we only have time for one more. <laughs> Joseph Warren is a lost hero of the American Revolution. Lost no more. You've returned him to us in your book as patriotic car keys that the American nation had lost for too long under the national couch cushions. What do you hope that readers will learn from Dr. Warren's example, not just on the battlefield, not just on the home front as a physician, but in general to inspire them in their lives? Because I feel that a good historical figure, you can look at him and find a lot of things. You can look at her and find a lot of things and find a way to be inspired. So what do you hope with Dr. Warren will inspire your readers? I think if they could take anything away from it is that, you know, People can elbow their way out of their situation. Again, Warren was not born with this silver spoon in his mouth, and he had a tougher time back then rising to these top levels in society. But, you know, again, he proved himself at Harvard. So he becomes an educated man. And just think about the sacrifices he made throughout his life. I mean, think about the gut-wrenching conditions in that Castle William inoculation hospital during that smallpox outbreak of 1764 that Warren's trying to save lives. Again, selfless acts of bravery. You know, he put his townspeople before himself. Here's someone who keeps proving it over and over again with his actions not just his words. You could talk all you want for those 10 years during the revolutionary period. And when push comes to shove and that battle is starting, he voluntarily goes there. People were outraged that he went because he was too important to take that chance, but yet he goes. So again, time and time again, he's proving himself and he's putting other people before himself. And I think that's a lesson we can take today, because again, this is someone who is not interested in financial gain. I say this in the book, when he joins the the Whig Patriots, he's basically committing financial suicide because he's getting so much financial patronage from the Tories and the Loyalists. This is someone who lost his father as a teenager. He had to face a lot of difficulties and hardships, but he's able to overcome them with hard work, educating himself, caring for others, and he proves this on the battlefield. Well, Christian Despina, author of Founding Martyr, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to introduce us to Dr. Warren and for the two decades that you spent being relentless and not, not taking no for an answer to restore him to his rightful prominence in the story of the United States. I liked what you said about we all own a piece of him. He belongs to all of us. And so I hope people will 
take the time, go and meet him, pick up your book, and really be inspired by the guy in a cause for liberty that he didn't even get to enjoy the fruits of. He wasn't there at the big signing ceremony. He wasn't there at Maybe's Tavern, now the old 76 house, to see the final victory and see the British finally surrender control of the colonies. But he laid down his life just as one brick in that great path that is the American story. And we're all bricks today, and you've given him back to us so we can look back and remember his sacrifice. I wish you the best of luck with this book, and I hope that listeners will pick it up and draw all the inspiration they can from this martyr of the American Revolution. Dean, I really appreciate it. I wish we could do this every day. <laughs> wow, well, that's high praise indeed. I hope that we can do some stuff in the future because I, I just love your passion. It's infectious. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. Again, the book is Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying the book through us, you help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. Thanks to Christian Despina for bringing all of his passion today and for giving freedom-loving people everywhere back a founding father lost in the mists of history. Find our guest at foundingmartyr.com or martyr1776 on Twitter. Or you can find him at Colonial Williamsburg personally taking people on trips into the past. And you can let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. And there's our new YouTube page, where you can find our full archive of almost 200 interviews. When you're in those archives, I highly recommend my really fun, high-energy conversation with Feather S. Foster. That book is Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas and other stories from the First Lady's Closet. You'll also find my discussion with Robert Norton of the Old 76 House in Japan, New York, where George Washington first heard news of Benedict Arnold's betrayal. And they kept that British conspirator, the dashing Major John Andre, locked up before his execution. Today, the 76 House is America's oldest restaurant and a physical link to the era historians like Feather and Christian bring to life. That's it for this Yankee Doodle installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together... Thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. 